Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Casey Olinder. I'm the web content specialist here at the Hendrick Center at DTS. And today I'm really excited because our topic is humor. We're joined by Dr. Steve Wilkins. He is the professor of philosophy and ethics at Azusa Pacific University, and he also wrote a book called What's So Funny About God? A Theological Look at Humor. Thanks for being with us today, Steve. Oh, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Look forward to this. Yeah, I'm excited about it. We are also joined by Dr. Robert Duckworth, Director of Counseling Services and Adjunct Professor here at DTS. Thanks for being here, Robert. Glad to be here as always. (laughs) Yeah. Well, my hope today is, I'm going to borrow one of Steve's phrases, um, but my hope today is to think theologically about humor and also to think humorously about theology. Humor is just part of our existence as human beings. We all are created by God, and so I think that there might be something meaningful in there, and so it'll be worth reflecting on. I wanted to start off with a quote that Steve uses in his book because it's highly appropriate for this conversation. Um, But it says, humor can be dissected as a frog can, but the thing dies in the process and the innards are discouraging to any but the purely scientific mind. And apparently that's a risk we're willing to take here on the Table podcast. So (laughs) I'm excited to to jump in with each of you guys and interested to hear about, um, yeah, how you guys came to think in this area. And so we'll start with you, Robert. I said that you're the director of counseling services, but Mm -hmm. how did you start taking humor seriously? Oh, I think it was probably just as a child um, watching my parents. Um, my dad was a pretty humorous guy. His he was not as in, it was not his intention to be humorous, but uh, he was funny. Uh, my dad was a master impressionist. Hmm. When he would talk about people um, in the community, people he may have been frustrated with at church. Or on the job, he would just naturally impersonate them. <laughs> and that, I would watch it, and he didn't realize it until many years later when one day he chastised us yet again when he was talking about a situation with someone that had done something he didn't approve of. And um, he was impersonating the guy. And we just, were laughing. He said, I'm not telling you this to be funny. This is just to help you all know not to be silly or ignorant like this. I said, Dad, do you not realize all these years? And I had to stop him. I was an adult then, so I had all this authority to say these (laughs) things to him. So I'm an adult, and I say to him, I said, do you realize all these years when you would talk about people, you would get into character and become them, and it was hilarious to hear you say things that they said and sound like them. Mm -hmm. And he said, I never realized it. I mean, it was like a complete shock to him. He was well into his 70s by then. And I naturally picked up on those skills uh, growing up. So when I remembered when I was in school, we would, you know, the guys, we used to have this thing that would, go, it changes over the years. I think now kids call it snapping or, or, or capping or, I don't know what they call it today. You can never keep up with these kids. Mm-hmm. Steve, you, know, you can't keep up with them at all. But, but it's, um, we would do it, they would even call it the dozens, and we would get in there, we'd talk about each other, but that's when I would make things humorous, and, and I took it serious. I was probably in fourth, fifth grade, probably even earlier than that, because mm-hmm. I just, um, I remember a kindergarten teacher told my mom uh, that, uh, she said, he's so hilarious, and at that time, when I was in kindergarten, I'm going to age myself, um, she said, that's my little Richard Pryor. <laughs> so I never forgot that, and uh, I was just a humorous guy. So I think just as a, as a, as a, at a young age, I, I really I took being funny seriously, and I got to the point where I'd start write, writing things down that would be funny, and and that was just kind of the way it was. I was wired mm-hmm. through family members, dad, mom knew how to put storylines together, uh, just because she was a good speaker. Uh, She was a teacher, and uh, my dad was, um, you know, this impressionist, and then I had an uncle that was just just raw funny, and I would always be with him, so... I, I, I enjoyed laughter. I, I enjoyed humor. So that I think that was the beginning for me as a child. Yeah. And that, that impression. And it still sticks with me today. Mm-hmm. 
So you started off young, and then what, what bearing did that have on your vocation as you grew into adulthood? Oh my goodness, people think I'm confused. I've been in so many professions. I was in corporate America. <laughs> I wanted to be a lawyer before I went to corporate America. I went to corporate America because I needed a job after I graduated from high school, from college, sure. and, and I was like, I need to just go to work. I don't have time to go back to school, and and I had no interest in 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 school after after my bachelor's, and then I ended up getting a job, and and then um, I continued to be the humorous person that I was on the job and and every so often people would say you should be doing something else like in theater other than business why are you doing this I mean you're good at your job but you would seem like you'd have more uh, excitement about doing that and I said yeah I would but I just didn't think it was realistic mm -hmm. so I started writing after so many people kept telling me that in probably 1996 I started writing comedy routines and trying to figure out what it would be like to be a comedian, but I was like, I don't think I'd ever go on that stage and try that. That is a very, very, and it is a very, very difficult job mm -hmm. to do. And I started writing those comedy routines back in 1996. And I held on to those jokes from 96 to probably 98 before I ever stepped foot on a stage. But what I ended up doing, now this, I just definitely believe this is a God thing and God's sense of humor. He took me through that a corporate career and then having this sense of humor and the first opportunity I ever had to go on stage as a comedian was not at a comedy club but it was the National Association of Black Accountants mm -hmm. and they were having a convention and I knew it was all these corporate folks black folks and I was like, well, I know two things in this room. I've been in the corporate world, and I'm black. And I knew how to make both of those crowds laugh. And so I got in, did an act, and it went over very, very well. And in that particular show, met some comedians that um, um, that were in that particular show um, that kind of groomed me and took me under their wing. And we started going to comedy clubs and they would take me to comedy clubs. And that's how I started doing comedy. But I kept my yeah. day job. I wasn't, I was not, you know, out of my mind. I kept my day job, but I was moonlighting as a comedian for three or four years. That's fascinating. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, Robert, I love that you did stand-up comedy. I feel like that's, yeah, that's really rare. And mm -hmm. like you said, kind of providential that mm -hmm. the Lord was working it out. Absolutely. Even when you thought, yeah, that you wouldn't do it professionally. But Steve, what about you? How did you first get started in um, thinking seriously about humor? Well, it's, it's really, it almost sounds too simple. But I've always just loved humor. Mm -hmm. And I love God. And so... You know, you kind of want to see how the two fit together. And so I started thinking, theologians poke their nose into everything. <laughs> so surely there's something out there on theology and humor. You know, there's theology and books uh, by, the, by the truckload. And I really didn't find much. And so I thought, well, I guess I'll just have to write it. So... Um, so that's what I ended up doing. And it, I, I've never written a book that was so hard to write and so much fun at the same time. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm glad you did. I, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. My husband and I have this joke that, uh, humor is one of our family values. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's not a joke because I don't know what our other family values are. And pretty much every time we come <laughs> home, we start off with, okay, this is what I, what I said in a meeting today that was really funny. Or like, this is that funny thing that happened to me at work. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I totally agree with what you're saying, Steve. I love God, and I think that being funny has its value, so there must be some sort of way that they fit together. So as I was searching for resources on Amazon, that was your book was one of the things that came up, and I was like, oh, this is exactly what I was looking for, and I'm glad that somebody has already done the legwork to write it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as you get into it, you find that there have been others who have, have been in this area as, uh, as well, uh, but you know, a lot of times they were kind of writing off to the side of where I wanted to be. But, uh, you know, their insights really helped me. And uh, also did some work in the philosophy of humor. Uh, believe it or not, uh, philosophers have taken humor pretty seriously, and psychologists have as well. And it makes sense because it's such a, a, a deep part of our lives. 
It is. That kind of brings me to, okay, is it possible to define humor? Can we at least describe it or does it have some hallmarks? Like what is humor? Mm, very good question. Uh, you you have all these different, uh, sometimes people say tragedy turned inside out. I think mm. that's the terminology that's been used. I've never yeah. thought about, I've just never thought about defining humor. It's just funny. I've just never thought of a, putting a definition on it mm -hmm. or, or coming up with this scholastic uh, response as to what it is. It's just humor. It is what it is. Yeah. I, uh, I have the Merriam-Webster definition here uh, okay. that says humor is that quality which appeals to a sense of the ludicrous or absurdly incongruous, a funny or amusing quality. And it just seems to me like that falls so far short of what the reality is when we experience humor. And yet it's because it's one of those things that's so difficult to put into words. You know, like we have uh, almost a visceral reaction, like laughter is something that happens to us physiologically or biologically. I'm not a scientist, but... Mm -hmm. It happens to us. It's a response to either situations or words or intentional jokes, things that we experience in the world. So um, what about how, what is it about humor that we love or at least the three of us that we uh, like find ourselves drawn to? Steve, can I start with you? Yeah. Um, well, uh, again, it's, it's kind of hard to put into words, but for me, humor is a love language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's that's how I say I love you to my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as I said in the book, if I came right out and told my friends I love them, they'd think I'd probably just been diagnosed with stage four cancer or something. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's that playful attitude with my kids, with my wife that, uh, you know, just is is a, a gentle but understood way of, of expressing love. Um, and I think there are a lot of other things that go with that, too. Um, so, um, for example, um, on Match.com, both males and females put a sense of humor in the top three of what they were looking for in a potential mate. Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we don't know how to define that. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know how to define it. But at the same time, you know, uh, people who have a sense of humor, who laugh easily, are perceived as more loving, hmm. more social, and more caring. Which matters And so, us. so you know, uh, there's that empathetic response. What happens when you see a couple of people laughing? As long as you're confident they're not laughing at you. Right. You know? <laughs> That's right. The, 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 the first thing we say is, what's so funny? Because once they share that, you're in. Mm -hmm. it's it's a means of inclusion and can be but on the other hand it can be a uh, very exclusionary as well mm -hmm. you know where where we use uh, humor as a blunt instrument and uh, and so uh, it's got power in both directions mm -hmm. yeah as christians we care deeply about what it means to love somebody what it means to show care to people what it means to connect with people and so if humor is a tool that we can use for that like it makes sense that we would want to explore it and delve into it absolutely yeah i would say i use it uh tremendously in my work as a counselor hmm. when i'm counseling um uh clients uh, if we were somehow able to get all of these many, many, many people, hundreds of people to uh, sign a release <laughs> to come and give a testimonial <laughs> about their time of working with me in counseling. And most of them would pr probably tell you that they were able to laugh in counseling with me. And in my work as a professor, as a student of, of my students, I, I they laugh in class. I It naturally happens. I don't go in there with the intention. It just it just happens, mm -hmm. and it is. It breaks down walls, so many walls. I've had some very difficult conversations with people. I've had many conversations on the subject of multiculturalism, diversity, in in a world where that just continuously gets. Uh, uh, it, it, it creates a, more of a divide. I have seen people be able to come together in the room by having a lighthearted conversation about those yes. very subjects. Mm -hmm. And yep. it just, it breaks down walls. And I think God is excited about using that. Mm. 
and, and I praise God that he gave me this gift of, of humor mm-hmm. to, to be able to do that in so many ways. And it doesn't have to necessarily be in a major comedy club or have your own television show. Mm-hmm. It makes a difference in people's lives in a 50-minute counseling session or in a three-hour class uh, setting. It does. Yeah, it makes yeah. you relatable. It makes you personable. And I think sometimes, too, it's a way of communicating truth to people, mm-hmm. like oh, yeah. whether it's by satire or whether it's, you know, by kind of poking fun. And a lot of times the comedians that are the funniest are the ones that are the most relatable. They're pointing out things. Oh, yes, I've definitely been there. I've definitely had that experience. And that's what makes it so that's funny right. is it's making observations about the world around us. Well, and, and one of the interesting things about humor, too, is um, it's a form of confession. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you the truth about myself in a humorous way when I wouldn't say it in a straightforward way. And so, um, you know, I've often said that uh, people don't go to the comedy club to see a hero. They go to see themselves uh, in sometimes an exaggerated version. And so, you know, uh, it's it's a way we can kind of sit back and say, I think they know me. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, you know, it's it's kind of a catharsis, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you go in there, you can kind of laugh at yourself, you can laugh at the world. And um, I, I, I think it's uh, very important in that way. And I, I would say amen to what you said about the classroom. Uh, you may not believe this. But sometimes 19-year-olds are intimidated by philosophy, <laughs> and I, I can get them to loosen up a little bit, you know, if, if we can laugh a little bit and, you know, just throw in a one-liner here and there. Or, uh, and so it, it, uh, it lightens up the room. Mm-hmm. It does. I think it, like takes a level of intelligence too to kind of like you're saying like think on your feet and get it to be something that people are able to relate to so i think we've highlighted a lot of really positive aspects of humor mm-hmm. that you know it helps us connect to people it helps us uh, teach people truth sometimes um but another related question do you think that we would have humor if it weren't for the fall We wrestled with that in our little chat that day, and I was, I purposely didn't read a word in (laughs) Steve's book yet, but I can't wait to read it until after I get out of here today. But um, uh, I wrestled with that because if you go back to that definition of turning a tragedy into something beautiful or it's to our tragedy turned inside out becomes humor. Well, pre-fall, there was no tragedy. Mm-hmm. There was no tragedy. I uh, had a de- kind of a little debate over the phone uh, the other night with one of my buddies. And he said, I think it would have been humor uh, uh, pre-fall. I said, well, it probably would. I, I definitely believe it was joy. I think it was laughter between Adam and Eve. Uh, somewhere it was probably laughter somewhere between the end of chapter two and <laughs> chapter three of Genesis, mm-hmm. but they 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 probably had laughter and joy, and he picked on her. She picked on her. I don't know. I'm sure, but it wasn't humor based upon tragedy or or to make myself. Uh, make a light of a difficult situation because there was there was no difficult situation mm-hmm. as far as I can see. All of that was post fall, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. I think there was laughter. I think there was some joy, but would have have really been a need for humor or comedy prior to the fall. I don't think so. So I think people would have laughed, but I don't know if it would have been in the uh, context of a joke or a humorous situation, unless they were looking around at the different animals and just what they were doing. I don't know. Depends on what the animals were doing. So (laughs) that might have made someone laugh. And I guess that's humor. Yeah, maybe so. As I process through it, Steve, you're the philosopher. You can tell us. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I, I do have a little section in there on will there be humor in heaven? And I agree with you. I think there'll be lots of laughter, lots of joy. But I think uh, probably the most important trigger for humor is incongruity. 
we see things that don't fit. And a lot of those things that don't fit is because we don't have a God's eye view on things. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things Christians struggle with is the fact that we are embodied beings, you know, and uh, far too many Christians act as if somehow we escaped from God's lab, you know, during beta testing, and God was going to take our bodies away. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, that we die of the same diseases that our pets do, yes. but at the same time, you know, our pets don't have a sense of humor, uh, and they don't write constitutions, they don't compose poetry. And so there's this odd incongruity where you know, if you want to call it body and soul, let's call it that. Uh, but um, we've got two things that don't seem to fit together. And in the same way, uh, the whole story of the incarnation, uh, it's no accident that most of the earliest heresies arose in the church because of the inability of people to perceive God taking on meat hmm. and becoming flesh. And so, you know, uh, we struggle with that, whereas in heaven we'll say, that's kind of a no-brainer, I guess. It, it, it doesn't seem to be, you know, uh, incongruous. It, it, it's just the way, the way God intends it. Mm-hmm. Sure. So there may not be this juxtaposition of way that we think something should be and the way that it's not or any of that other yeah. incongruous yeah. things that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of times I talk about how uh, we live Holy Saturday, you know? We are stuck between uh, all the horrors and the ugliness of Good Friday and the joy of Easter, and and we live with the foot in each world. Mm-hmm. And I, I think a lot of our humor comes out of that, you know? Uh, we, we live by two different calendars, you know? Uh, we celebrate Holy Week but we also celebrate Shark Week, you know? <laughs> and so uh, it's it's that uh, odd uh, dual citizenship sort of thing that I think is at the root of so much humor. Absolutely. And you know, when I think about those posts, well, you think pre-fall, post-fall, I, I, I've always believed Jesus and those 12 disciples, those apostles that are traveling with him. I know guys, if I'm hanging out with 12 guys and we've got, we have work to do and we're doing all these things, at some point there's going to be horseplay. There's going to be some level of just jovial behavior. You know, you know, look at Judas's hair. I mean, it, it could have been anything like that. And, and, you know, and everybody's having a big, you know, a fun time around this whole thing. I just believe they probably had a good time. Uh, and now we read about what's serious because our, our lives are hanging on this. But I have to believe Jesus as a child played with other children and they had fun. They wrestled. They did things. Um, I, I believe uh the disciples probably in their travel. These were, I would say, adult men going out doing work. But I know how it is around here. Even at DTS, we do have fun at <laughs> DTS over here. And we laugh and we're jovial with each other. And it is just, that's. I think that's a part of the community that mm-hmm. God has created in us. And out in that community, there will be humor that comes in it. And I just don't believe those 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 13 men hanging out um, uh, didn't have a good time uh, together mm-hmm. I, I just don't think I don't think I don't think they would have done that and, and didn't have a good time I think they probably and we know they debated we know they had a hard time with each other on different things and didn't agree but I think they had some fun together too because that's what guys do when we get together and even that's what friends do. It seems oh, like yeah. a, a common misconception that holiness and humor are incompatible. You know, oh, like, Lord, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if we're going to take something seriously, then we never can laugh about it. But, I mean, 
I don't know, I have a pastor who preaches funny sermons, you know, like (laughs) a lot of times we might laugh in church or that'll be something that's really memorable is, Mm -hmm. oh, I know that was a joke, but the serious underlying meaning was actually really convicting, (laughs) but he delivered it in a way that made it palatable for people. And so probably in the same way, you're talking about Jesus and his disciples too, just because of the relational aspect, how could they not have been having a good time? How could they not have been making jokes and probably saying something funny? Absolutely. And I think, because we never see it in, most of the time when we have chapel speakers here, somebody says something, I would say the majority of the time, someone is going to say something that's funny. Mm-hmm. And if you have any chapel speakers that were once students here, they'll say something that that entire audience mm-hmm. relates to mm-hmm. and, the, and it erupts in laughter. So that is, uh, I think it's a natural part of who we are. So maybe that's our definition. Humor is a natural part of who we are and it, it is very soothing and healing to us. Yes. So you put that in your dictionary. That's what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call Miriam Webster real fast. We'll Absolutely. Have him edit that. Call him. Let's get that in there quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that brings us to you brought up Jesus and the disciples. Where else is there humor in scripture? I'll, I'll start off with the most recent time that I read Esther. I thought that book was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Haman is doing some crazy things. He's cooking up these schemes and he's <laughs> acting all conceited, like, who would the king delight to honor more than me? No one. And so <laughs> then he goes around and has to do all of this amazing stuff for his mortal enemy. Like, that's hilarious. How ironic and all of the, you know, like, quote unquote, coincidences in there that are really the Lord's providence. So I, uh, I noticed that the most recent time that I read Esther, but I wonder if there's anything else that comes to mind for you guys. Things that come to mind, Steve. Yeah. Steve. Well, I, I did a little interlude on Esther in the book, uh, but I also uh, spent some time in, um, um, oops, I forgot to plug my computer in, uh, did a little bit of work in Jonah. And I think jo- uh, Jonah is one of the most hilarious books in, in the Bible, because here's this guy who's supposed to be on God's A-team, and God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, And he heads for Tarshish, which is about as close to 180 degrees off compass point that you can get. So uh, I think I think that's hilarious. And then he goes to Nineveh and um, preaches probably the most unenthusiastic sermon possible. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But yet people repent right down to the livestock. Right. Mm -hmm. I got to grab my power cord before I go go dark on you here. No, yeah, those are good examples. And I think, too, of um, that there are sometimes, like, <laughs> I thought of Sarah this morning and how she uh, laughs at laughs. the very, very idea that, you know, God could give them a child in their old age. And, and God calls her out, oh, you laughed. And she's like, no, I didn't. No. And he's like, well, you did. So, <laughs> we, yeah, I'm omniscient. So, I actually know that you did. Um Different stuff like that. I couldn't imagine trying to change diapers at 100 years old. <laughs> it, it's, it's, I didn't want to do it at 32. <laughs> so <laughs> it was it, all those, yes, you could find humor. I know when I first started writing, I, I used to struggle with it. I think I struggled with trying to write humor about scriptural um uh, context or, or or stories or narratives in the scripture, because I think I was wrestling with the fact this is holy stuff. I shouldn't really be making light of it, but I'll make light of the church. So that's what I would do. I, I did those things. A lot of my comedy when I would do shows for churches would be uh, would revolve more around uh, making light of uh, the the current church or the contemporary church or the church as we know it today mm-hmm. and all the stereotypes that go with the church today and the, uh, and the like. So that that's what I was more, um, that was kind of my genre that I wrote too. But I think if I was to go back now and write, and which I am writing now, it is much easier to use um, uh, content from, um, um, from the scriptures and, and really find humor in, in those things and, and you know just finding anything it'd be I just can't think of anything off the top of my head but Balaam's just Jesus donkey. Yeah, G- the donkey that's been used people have talked about that yeah. Jesus comes back you have promised you the promised Messiah you died you died a brutal death and and you come back, you walk through a door, and you start. The first thing you do is, hey, you guys have anything to eat? <laughs> you you got to come up with something better than that, Jesus. I mean, you gotta, like, how did this happen? He had told us how it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But the first thing he comes up, let's let's have some dinner. 
you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So I just think that's uh, those there's stories you can come up with all together and make it light uh, lighthearted, but it might convey a true message about the scriptures. And if it helps with the truth, well, praise God. Mm-hmm. Praise God. I've got to believe that one of the most uh, hilarious scenes in there is when Jesus joins the two disciples who are heading back to Emmaus. Mm-hmm. And he kind of comes up and says, hey, guys, what are you talking about? And they said, are you the only one who isn't in on this? <laughs> this guy is not in the know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I just got to imagine Jesus uh, doing everything he could to uh, not burst into laughter and say, well, do tell, you know, bring me up to date on this. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's absolutely a hilarious story. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. I think perhaps that humor is one of those genre pieces that we need to look for in Scripture because there is so much of this irony that mm-hmm. a dead person came back to life. They don't normally do that. Like, Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things that are incongruous or unexpected that I think it it merits us at least looking at um, when we read Scripture because it's God's revelation to us. And so um, if it's one of the the means by which we understand things, then it's at least worth considering. Um, yeah. uh, one other thing that uh, fits in there, too, is if, if you're open to surprise when you're reading the Bible, Look at how many times God does the least expected thing. You know, uh, David, you know, the, the the youngest of all these sons, uh, ends up as uh, king of Israel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul, Mr. Super Jew, becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Uh, God is always choosing the least likely person. And, uh, you know, when you look through that Hebrews 11 Hall of Faith, well, yeah, there's a lot they did that was admirable, but in many ways, they were giant goof-ups, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and so uh, you got murderers and swindlers in that group and a couple of guys who tried to pass off their uh, wives as sisters so they could save their own bacon. And uh, it, it, it doesn't happen in the way you would expect it to. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you get four Gentile women showing up in Jesus' genealogy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of this stuff that shouldn't happen keeps happening. Yeah. Yeah, that is meant to catch us off guard. Sometimes we, I think, wrestle with over-familiarity that we're like, oh, I've read this before. I know Jesus is coming back. It's not a big deal. But the over, like, <laughs> we need to appreciate those things that you're pointing out. Like, that actually is really shocking that these different people would have these significant roles in the narr- narrative of Scripture. Um, and it's, yeah, it should bring us maybe some delight and pleasure that, oh, God uses regular people like us. And that should be surprising and not just what's expected. Absolutely. I, I think about just using me. I mean, that's a great example. Uh you know, people find out now you've gone into ministry, and people are just. I, I would go back to my uh, my college homecomings, and and we would we have these grand times, and, and they knew me as this jokester and this uh, humorist, and always doing these fun things and just outrageous stuff. And they're like, "You're in ministry," and 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 oftentimes their response is, "God." really does have a sense of humor <laughs> to use you and to see this guy that would play practical jokes on people in college and to see you come back and your whole your whole goal is to humiliate people and now you're trying to build them I said yeah I try to build back up the same people I humiliated mm-hmm. just have to do it with Jesus Christ now and it works mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. so yeah he uses it and I love what Steve is saying I think that's just that alone is is humorous that God uh, but truth that he uses these broken people to do such magnificent things to redeem us. Mm-hmm. So it's it's more to uh, more, more theology and humor than I ever even thought. Mm-hmm. Even in this conversation I'm learning about. <laughs> yeah. And just because something is 
beautiful and humbling that the fact that God uses us doesn't mean that it also can't be funny. That's right. Yeah. Um, do you think that there is such a thing as objectively funny, the way that we have objective morality? Some things, you know, we know that there is right and wrong. Sometimes we disagree on exactly what right and wrong might be in a given situation, but there is a right and a wrong. Do you think that there might be an objectively funny? A right and wrong, an objectively funny. So something that shouldn't be funny is what you're saying? That or No, just that there are categories of funny and not funny. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. it's funny even if you're not laughing at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, a, a lot of humor is very cultural. Mm -hmm. And so one of the weirdest things that came out of this book is um, I had a Russian Christian ask for permission to translate the book into Russian hmm. uh, because he says uh, the Russian Christians tend to associate solemnity with piety. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think your book uh, – really makes a good case for doing it otherwise. But he says, I'm going to have to rewrite a lot of the jokes because because they, they won't play in Moscow. No. Or the wordplay even. It, it just doesn't translate. Yeah. 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 Yeah, those things I won't do uh, as, as a comedian. I just I wouldn't do um, knowing that it would harm someone, causing mm -hmm. harm to someone. And, and 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 I know it. And there's stuff that I could say that would be funny to a big audience, but if it would harm that one guy or that person here, yeah, that I just don't touch it. Mm -hmm. But then there's other things that I'm just driving down the road, and it pops in my head, and I was like, man, if I had a place to go and say that, mm -hmm. I would say it, and I'll say it to my friends, and they're yeah. dying laughing over the phone or if we're on a Zoom or we're just hanging out or whatever and they're, they're laughing. I was like, they're like, you need to write that down. I was like, where can I perform it? I'll lose my job at DTS. I won't get to preach at church. <laughs> my family my family won't respect me. I mean, but it's hilarious. And there are things that you just, and you just have to keep it to yourself or keep it amongst your private, you know, your, your, your inner circle, really. And, and don't go with it, but um, but then there are some things that I do, and it's edgy, and I have done, and I've said them, and people loved it, and oftentimes yeah. it was people within a very pious Christian audience that was would tell me, man, I love that joke you said about blah blah blah, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and 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 so you know it's not just you laughing. And others are laughing. And most of the, I mean, I wouldn't say all the people, but a lot of the people that I hang around with are Christians. I would say probably most of them are. Yeah, they are Christians. And uh, as I'm thinking about my friend crowd, and there's some I'm still working on, too, because I'm witnessing to them. Mm -hmm. But most of my friends are Christian, but they find some of these, some of these, I guess, probably even crass thoughts that I may have about uh, some subject matter, very humorous, and they laugh at it. And, and then in, in the African-American community, we'll tell somebody, you're wrong for that. But they'll die laughing because you know it's wrong. We shouldn't say that publicly, but you're laughing. Mm. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah what, one of the main theories of what makes something funny is called benign violation. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm. so uh, there's a little aggressiveness in the joke, but it doesn't go over the boundary. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So you nudge the envelope. Um, the problem is, though, the line is in different places for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I've, I've got a pretty high tolerance uh, for, you know, jokes that others might consider it, it, un, uh, inappropriate. But uh, you got to you got to know the you got to know the room. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I was here nodding my head saying, yeah, there are things that I will say to my friends <laughs> that I I can't say in a classroom. That's right. Uh, it did get me thrown out, uh, or I couldn't say to certain people with you know certain trigger points, and so um, yeah, a, a, a lot of a lot of what's important in humor is the relational aspect, mm -hmm. knowing 
knowing the other. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point Absolutely. that there's always boundaries to be drawn because our goal is to love people. We want to care about people. We want to connect with people. And so we never want to use humor to dehumanize people or ridicule them. Um, and at the same time, also, we can have a little bit of levity to, for example, like laugh at ourselves. One time my husband and I were at a family gathering and, uh, you know, somebody made a joke about our denomination. And so the people around us were like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know they were going to say that. We were like, that's okay. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's fine. Like, it's, it's okay to like poke fun at each other. And <laughs> we didn't take it personally. And it was, like you said, very benign. Um, and so I think that that also, like there's a, a delicate balance to this benign violation that you're talking about where it, it it's, it's a huge cultural discussion right now i mean uh, a lot of the biggest names in comedy won't do college campuses because everybody is so sensitive about everything mm -hmm. and you know they uh they don't need that hassle mm -hmm. you know they, they don't need people uh, getting on their Twitter accounts trying to cancel them. So mm -hmm. they, they just don't do it. Um, and so I've often wondered whether it's a good metric of how spiritually healthy we are if we are willing to be the target of humor mm -hmm. and perhaps hear truths about ourselves mm -hmm. um, that uh, are funny and have truth but may have a bit of an edge to it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's a difficult thing to <laughs> take something seriously and at the same time not hold them too closely. You know, if our identity is ultimately secure in Christ, then maybe it's okay if people poke fun at us a little bit for whatever reason, especially in the context of a caring relationship, in the context of our friends and people that we've established relationships with. And, um, so we talked about that that humor can connect people, whether in a classroom, in a seminar, mm -hmm. different things. Humor can um, bring us together, and it also can um, be a tool that we use for even reading some of Scripture and seeing. Um, yeah, Robert, I love that you pointed out that <laughs> once you came to know Christ, it's not like you immediately everything funny about you went out the window. No. Now it's something that the Lord uses in your life. But, he has. He's done that. Um just thinking about, and I'm gonna, can I back up to the other thought of just the on the cancel stuff, like with these uh, college campuses. He, uh, Steve's exactly right, and cancellation is going backwards and forwards in different ways because you can get canceled in environments where they're holding up a moral standard. The Christian Church, you know, they, they have this standard, but if you say something humorous about and attacked that, you would be canceled from that particular culture. So it's just, it's cancellation goes back. Either way, it can be towards a, a more of a believing audience, they can cancel you, or a non believing audience can do. And I like to use it. I try not to go into the whole left right debate because I'm just trying to get away from that. But um, back to your other question, so I wanted to just kind of point that out, but back to the, the question about how God can really use it after you have accepted Christ. Uh, I, I, I was able to explicitly see how that took place for me, the humor, because I remember the first time that my church, my former church, went in and did prison ministry uh, at, a, at a prison in Palestine, Texas. This is a maximum security prison, probably more than 3,000 inmates in this facility. I went through probably six or seven uh, checkpoints or gates of some sorts to get into this prison, walked down a, high, a hallway that looked like a highway. It had yellow tape or lines in the, in the middle where these guys have to walk on this side and other guys walk on this side like you're on a highway. And it looked like a highway. It was just this long gangway down here, and all you could see is bars and walls. So I'm in this prison, and I go up, and and it was like the Lord was nudging me. I didn't hear a voice. I always tell people I didn't hear a voice. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I felt a nudging. Use what you have. Talk about your experience getting here, and the first thing I told those guys before I went up, when I went up, I took the microphone. I was scheduled to preach in the prison, and when I walked up, 
and I described my journey to prison ministry and my first time of ever seeing an inmate working on the side of the road when I was growing up in Arkansas and didn't know what that was. Was And I was like, well, who are these guys out here in these white suits out here working? And I was telling these guys in prison, I said, my dad did not give me the textbook answer. He didn't say, well, those are guys that committed crimes and they're paying for their crimes. Oh, those are bad guys. They did wrong. All oh, those guys are being punished for the wrong that they did in life. No, my dad said, that's where you're going to end up if you don't stop being hard-headed. <laughs> and when I said that, the room erupted in laughter. And immediately I felt like God was saying, that's why I had you at the Laugh Factory. That's why I had you on television, because I was training you for this moment right here. And when I saw men accept Jesus Christ that day, after I was able to preach the gospel and was able to connect with them and break down those walls in a building full of walls, that's when I knew God was using humor to make a difference in the lives of his people and draw them to him. So uh, I was able to clearly see it, and um, that's why I love prison ministry, and it even came full circle where there were some inmates that actually had recognized me from television. And wow. It was amazing. So um, it, it, I, I'm just amazed at how God has used humor to help me really just deliver, deliver his word and deliver the message of, uh, of the cross. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's not just something that you're trying to excuse or rationalize. You're like, actually, the Lord is using it to draw people to Him and to Absolutely. use you. And yeah. we'll do it again. I, yeah, it's not just that. No, no, I will do it again mm -hmm. to to reach people uh, uh, for the kingdom. Mm hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Robert. Mm -hmm. And this has been a fun conversation. I really appreciate each of you guys and your willingness to take humor seriously, to really inspect it, and um, to think about how it really can be a gift from God and something that He can use and has used, and it's something that, that we can even use to love people well and teach them truth. So thank you guys, each of you, for being with us, Steve and Robert. Really thank you. grateful to have you. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, it was fun. And we uh, also want to thank our listeners. We're grateful that you've joined us. And we hope that you join us next time on The Table Podcast when we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.